Bangladesh might just be the most resilient country on the planet. Once the poorest part of British India, it became the most deprived part of Pakistan before experiencing the deadliest cyclone in human history. That was followed by a liberation war, famine, numerous political coups and assassinations, and devastating natural disasters. The important thing is that we have developed our internal capability to cope with many of these disasters. Bangladesh had to do it for its own survival. Famously referred to as a basket case in 1971 by US government officials, including Henry Kissinger, in per capita terms, it's now among the richest countries in South Asia, surpassing India in 2020. It's not so secret to economic success is what experts call RMG, ready-made garments. Every country in the world started their industrial revolution with RMG, be it London, New York, Japan, Korea, China, and now Bangladesh. The need to fill factory floors has made a positive impact on one group in particular, women. And that set Bangladesh apart from other Muslim-majority countries as well as India. This is also a component of the capitalist society that kind of promotes individualism and that could be one reason that a large number of women uh, came into work. They did not want to be chained as a domestic helping hand to any households. But Bangladesh might be a victim of its own success. In 2026, the UN will upgrade it from least developed country status, but this will mean the loss of economic benefits. Along with lasting bias towards women, Islamic fundamentalist groups, and no real plans to move beyond low-end manufacturing, the rapid progress of Bangladesh could be at risk. On August 15, 1947, the great symbol of the British Empire came down for the last time to be replaced by the banner of the new Indian government. The partition of India created two dominions to separate Muslim and non-Muslim populations, India and Western East Pakistan, which included modern-day Bangladesh. 14 million people were displaced because they left their homes. Anywhere between 1 and 2 million people, Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs, they died. Muslims who had been murdered on the way, Hindus and Sikhs who had been murdered by Muslims. People of our generation, the older generation, has almost died out. So that's the very tragic story of partition. For over two decades, the majority Bengali population in East Pakistan was ruled by a central government based in West Pakistan, which spent the majority of capital on its own development. So the Bengali grievance was that Bengal was being deprived of, of its legitimate share in economic resources. In the mid-1960s, that came to a head through a demand for regional autonomy which we call the Six Point uh, Program. We in Bangladesh called it our Magna Carta because the, from the Six Point onward, we went to one point, which was independence. But before obtaining independence, in 1970, the deadliest cyclone in human history took place, in which up to 500,000 people died. There was no response from the Pakistan government no measures toward rehabilitation, toward coming to the, to the aid of those who had survived, uh, coming to locate the bodies or calculate the damage that had been done. This accelerated the call for independence and during the first democratic election in Pakistan, the Awami League party led by Sheikh Mujibar Rahman won a decisive majority. Legally, I am the authority because people have voted to me. Now they are using their force. It is up to them now to decide what to do. Not wanting Pakistan to be ruled from the east, the central government in West Pakistan took military action. On the 25th of March, the Pakistan army launched what, what has come to be known as Operation Searchlight. It's estimated that uh, on, the, on the very first night, between 5,000 and 7,000 people were killed on the streets of Dhaka. And in the course uh, of more than nine months. The, the estimates put out by the government of Bangladesh is that three million people were killed. The killings, which Bangladesh calls genocide, were followed by a liberation war between East and West Pakistan. 
10 million refugees fled to India while the massacres continued and hundreds of thousands died. It was India that came to the rescue. An India-Bangladesh joint command was formed and very briskly, very swiftly, they conquered, they captured ever larger slices of territory in East Pakistan. And that was when the, uh, the People's Republic of Bangladesh was born. Although Bangladesh was newly independent, after years of turmoil, it was the second poorest nation in the world. And things were about to get worse. Industry is at a halt. Paraffin needed for cooking and heating is very scarce, and huge queues form for any supply that becomes available. In its first four years, the newly independent nation was plagued by mismanagement and food shortages that led to a disastrous famine in which an estimated 1.5 million people died. But then, the tragedy, again, another tragedy, Sheikh Mujib was assassinated by a group of junior military officers. He and most of his family were killed. Despite political instability, coups and assassinations, the 80s saw rapid economic improvements. There has been a sequence of reforms that has initiated the private sector-led growth in Bangladesh. You have to keep in mind that Bangladesh has started as a socialist country. It nationalized everything from banks to all kinds of factories, manufacturing and so on. The outcome was not very good and the government realized it and slowly started going back to the market mechanism, allowed the private sector to come in, which is the most important thing. At the same time, positive changes initiated by NGOs were embraced by the government, like BRAC, a non-profit created to help those in need after the Liberation War, and Grumeen Bank, the so-called bank for the poor. It gives millions in small loans to the impoverished without requiring collateral. 97% of its borrowers are women. Bangladesh being one of the poorest countries in the world, it was also a ground for experimentation for social development. This NGO sector, along supported by the government and also international community. I must say that uh, the donor community played a big role also in supporting the drive that, uh, that was uh, led by the government. And the result is that in a lot of social innovation, social engineering, Bangladesh has pioneered and, and established credible records for development which is being experimented or applied in parts of Africa, Latin America and other countries. This is a, something, something that we, we feel proud of. Although foreign aid played a big role in the development of Bangladesh, accounting for up to 8% of their gross national income in the 70s, it's now less than 2%. Life expectancy has jumped from 47 to 73 years. Bangladesh's female literacy rate is higher than India's, while its infant mortality rate is lower. Compared with the birth rate of a Muslim majority country, even compared with India, we are better off. Our birth rate has come down. Family planning has been adapted at every family level in Bangladesh, more or less. And there is no taboo about it. There is no religious barrier against it. Why? because of the NGO movement, because of awareness, because of government's role in that, also donor support. USAID has played a very significant role in, in, in popularizing uh, what I call uh, family planning in Bangladesh. So we have to admit that international community's role, domestic effort and the government all work together to bring about the changes. And that's why Bangladesh's population uh, now is almost at the replacement level. Another significant shift for Bangladesh was the birth of a new local industry. Inspired by the success of countries like Vietnam and China in exporting clothes abroad, Bangladesh began to build its own factories, creating a new entrepreneurial class. It's the low cost starting point because Bangladeshis didn't have capital. We are not a capital rich country and also didn't have the rich upper class and so on and so forth. So, most of them came from very ordinary middle class background and became entrepreneurs, became self-made entrepreneurs. It started like a very small enterprise operation and now they are big time players and supplying globally.
I started the government factory, very small government factory uh, in city centers. Now, of course, Viratex Group is one of the very renowned group. We have almost 15,000 workforce. I'm sure it is very surprising that we are designing product for the top brand in the world. Everything we do, that means not only the garment manufacturing, the entire process. We, we call ourselves end-to-end solution providers. We have six, seven garment manufacturing plants. We produce roughly 3 million uh, neat garments uh, every month and more than 1.5 million uh, woven shirts every month. Today, the garment industry accounts for up to 80% of the country's total exports. Part of its success is due to government initiatives like the Export Development Fund. Created in 1989, it allows exporters to borrow at lower interest rates. And Bangladesh's status as an LDC, or least developed country, gives it tax-free access to European markets to boost trade and economic growth. Also, as China moves away from low-end manufacturing towards higher-end products like cars, Bangladesh has been able to benefit. But perhaps the biggest beneficiaries of the garment industry are women, who had previously been unable to make dependable salaries. When this uh, garment business started, somehow we were able to attract this woman or female workforce to our industry. And that can help significantly to improve our uh, I mean, society. Just imagine, I mean, more than five million workforce, three million is a woman. Average salaries for workers in the ready-made garment industry are double the country's minimum wage, which means that women can become financially independent. In the rural areas, there are not that much uh, employment available. So the women, they took off from the rural areas that now they need to search for better employment. Another sociological thing is that the emancipation that they could leave by themselves. Even though their salary was quite meager, they also have their mind of their own. If they were working within uh, someone's house, uh, they did not have any vacation, no festival bonus given, no you know policies. At least in the garment sectors, uh, gradually the policies came into place so they could get a bonus the overtime and health security and other issues. High rate of participation in Bangladesh could be uh, correlated with the free education for girls. At the secondary level, you know, free stipend is given. We have a very strong NGO-based communities and the civil society who actually looked into this and encouraged women's uh, you know, participation. Since first serving as Prime Minister in 1996, Sheikh Hasina, daughter of the first elected President of Bangladesh, has also introduced laws to balance out the treatment of men and women. When this uh, Hasina Sharkar came into power, she herself uh, took a lot of positive steps for women's empowerment, particularly involving women in income generating activities, encouraging women to remain in the RMG sectors, and provided a lot of facilities uh, like daycares. She actually was the first Prime Minister that introduced the national policies for the advancement of women in 1997. And uh, there actually she directly mentioned in the policy that women should be given equal inheritance to property rights. But even though great progress has been made, women in Bangladesh are still not treated as equals. Women still seen as the second class citizen. The way the patriarchal society and the men and the society family and the state perceives is that women need to be controlled. There are very few women in the highest level of decision making, even in the administrative sector, even in the police, uh, uh, you know, Navy, uh, military. Uh, women are actually at the bottom of the hierarchy. There are also religious parties in the country that demand the imposition of Islamic laws, which would threaten the rights of women and the economy that depends on them to work. So even though the religious preachers, they say things about certain uh, rules and norms and customs women have to follow when they go you now for work, uh, they have never said that uh, like uh, broadly, in a wider form that women cannot work. Uh, and Bangladesh, it's, it's uh, of course, the secularism, this uh, pillar of one of the strongest pillars of our constitution. 
While a thriving industry has helped grow Bangladesh's economy and empower women, a big problem remains, abysmal working conditions. Of course, along the way, there have been tragedies. For example, a few years ago, there was a called Rana Plaza tra tragedy. There have been fires taking place, uh, occurring in uh, other garment industries. So those have been um, accidents, tragic accidents, which we as a nation regret and which we feel will not be happening anymore. After the Rana Plaza tragedy, where over 1,000 people died, nearly 200 international brands signed an agreement that allowed for legally binding safety commitments, independent inspections at the factories, and contributions for safety training and factory improvements. A renewal agreement was signed in 2021. The garment industry has been a boost for Bangladesh's economy. I think we, we got the idea of uh, improving, of uh, uh, going on to other areas, and of course, uh, exporting our goods abroad. So we have our sense of optimism is there, but then again, we're very cautious about the future. Exporting abroad could now be easier with the recent completion of the Padma Bridge, now the longest in Bangladesh that links the less developed southwest with the rest of the country. It offers a faster route to the second largest port for exporters shipping to Europe. If you put a ladder and climb it up as development goes up, we are still in the first step of the ladder. We have not yet broadened the, the export base to move up the ladder. We needed to move to light engineering, we needed to move to electronics. Government should play the enabling role and make the playing field even for all sectors, not only for the governments. If they can do that, um, I think we can see the winners which will come out of the market forces. As Bangladesh graduates from least developed country status, the loss of economic benefits will put pressure on its economy. Unless the government can sign tariff-free trade agreements, tackle corruption and diversify its economy, the goal of reaching upper middle income status by 2031 may not be met. <laughs>